What you just saw was about 80 iPhones, all synced up with a custom app I wrote, acting as one giant screen. Let me give you some context. So back in October 2020, I received an interesting text from my good friend and fellow YouTuber, Luke Miani. He told me that he had purchased a lot of 57 iPhones on eBay. I asked him why, and he said he wasn't sure, but figured it would make an interesting video. But very quickly, an idea was forming in my head. What if I could write an app that would connect all of the iPhones together? And over the course of the next eight months or so, that's exactly what I did. By the end of it, we were up to 101 iPhones, and we had a custom app that would connect them all together and make them do cool things. In this video, I'm going to explain how I made that app, what features the app has, and the interesting challenges that I ran into along the way. When I first had the idea to write the app, I was excited to get started. But before I could write any code, there was already an issue I had to deal with. The phones that Luke had purchased were iPhone 4s and 4Ss, like this one here. And as you may or may not know, these phones are very old. Apple's latest version of iOS is version 14, and iOS 15 is just around the corner. The iPhone 4S only supports through iOS 9, and the iPhone 4 only supports through iOS 7. Apple has long since ended support for these versions, so I couldn't just fire up the latest version of Xcode and use the latest version of Swift to make the app. No, to do this, I would have to go back to the past. I did a bit of research and discovered that Xcode 7 was the version that I wanted to use. The current version is Xcode 12, so this gives you a good idea of how far back into the past I had to go. Xcode 7 is the first version to support iOS 9 and the last version to support iOS 7, so it was the perfect overlap that I needed for the iPhone 4s and 4Ss. I was lucky to be able to use Xcode 7 for two additional reasons. First of all, I could sign in with my Apple developer account without encountering any SSL or deprecated API issues that are pretty common when running old software in modern times. And second of all, Xcode 7 is only the second version of Xcode to support Swift, so I didn't have to learn and use Objective-C. Xcode 7 was released in 2016 alongside OS 10.11 El Capitan, so I created an El Cap VM, installed Xcode 7, and fired it up. I created an empty Xcode project, plugged in an iPhone 4, and ran the app on it. It worked without any issues, so my environment was set up. But before I could really start coding the app, there was one more potential roadblock I had to deal with. For some of the features I wanted to implement, like the video screen, the iPhones had to be able to sync up with essentially no delay. Additionally, I wanted to be able to control the army of iPhones from my laptop, so I could just type in a command on my laptop, press enter, and all of the phones would carry it out in unison. I decided that the best way to satisfy both of these requirements was to use WebSockets. As the name implies, WebSockets is a web standard, and it's pretty similar to a regular old web request. So in a normal web request, you open a connection to a server, you ask it for some data, the server gives you the data and closes the connection. With WebSockets, you open a connection to a server and ask the server to leave the connection open. Then the server and client can exchange data with each other, and the data will show up on the other end pretty much instantly. So for the app, I would run a WebSocket server on my laptop, and the app would act as a WebSocket client. So each phone would establish its own connection to the server, and then when I type a command in on the server, it would send the command to each phone through its individual WebSocket connection. Now I had to make sure that I could use WebSockets in this old version of iOS. So I did a bit of research and found a WebSocket framework called Starscream. It had a branch for Swift 2, which is the old version of Swift that Xcode 7 uses. So I downloaded the framework and wrote a little test app. Sure enough, the app was able to connect to a server and exchange data. So now I was fully ready to start coding the app.
I decided to name the app Multiphone. Get it? It's a pun. Like multi-phone, multiple phones, but multi-iPhone, because they're all iPhones. I thought it was pretty clever. In the end, I developed five features for the app. Cards, chess, camera, Shrek, and video screen. In the rest of this video, I'm going to show you how each of these features works. Let's start with the cards feature, since it's the simplest. This feature will display a different card on each iPhone screen, so you could use the iPhones to play a game like poker, go fish, or war. So how does it work? Well, first let's talk about how the app works in general. When you open the app, you're presented with the connection screen. You enter the IP address and port of the server and the ID number of the phone. This is arbitrary. We just assign different ID numbers to each phone and put them on stickers on the back there. Then you tap the connect button and the app will establish a WebSocket connection to the server running on my laptop. The server will keep track of all open connections so that it can send data when I type in commands. Over on the server, I can see that my phone has connected. Now I'll type the card command. First, the server will tell each phone to open up the card view and then it'll wait until all of the phones are ready. Then the server will generate a 52 card deck, shuffle it, deal a card for each phone and send that card to the phone. So for example, this phone got the four of hearts, which means that the server sent it the message for H. When the phone receives the card it was dealt, it just has to pull up the corresponding image. All 52 card pictures are built into the app. All of the logic of shuffling the deck and dealing the cards is handled by the server. The app just has to display the image that the server tells it to. Simple, right? I can't believe how intense this game of war is. We have a double tie. All right, are you ready? We got a triple deal. One, two, three. Oh, oh my God, you won with the yeah. five. You won with the five. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Give it to oh, yeah. <laughs> At this point, you may be wondering why the server does so much of the work and why the app is so simple in comparison. This was an intentional design decision, and you'll see it in all of the features that we discuss. The primary reason is that changing the server is much easier than changing the app. So if I make an update to the server, I just have to restart it and reconnect all of the phones, which is something that I do pretty frequently anyways. But if I make an update to the app, I have to plug each individual phone into the computer and reinstall the app, which is incredibly tedious. Also, we want the server to do as much work as possible because it's the single source of truth for all data in the app. So if I had each phone randomly generate a card to display, it's pretty likely that two phones would end up displaying the same card. But if the server generates the deck and deals a card to each phone, we're guaranteed not to have any duplicates. Now let's get back to features and talk about chess. Chess is actually very similar to cards. The server will keep track of the chessboard and tell each phone which piece to display. The main difference though, is that we need to be able to do input on the phones. So if I want to move a chess piece, I need to tap on the phone that has that piece and then tap on the phone where I want to move the piece. Now remember, WebSockets allows for bi-directional communication, which means that the server can send data to the client, but the client can also send data to the server. And that's the key to making this feature work. So when I type in the chess command, the server will generate the board and tell each phone which piece to display, as well as which row and column it represents. Now let's say that I tap on one of the phones. If the phone doesn't have a piece on it, then nothing will happen because there's no piece there to move. But if there is a piece there, then that phone will tell the server that it was tapped on and the server will remember that that phone was the first one to be tapped on. Now I'll tap on a second phone, which is the square where I want to move the piece. The server remembers the first square I tapped on and now it knows the second square. So it takes the piece that's in the first square and puts it in the second square, and then it makes the first square empty since the piece was moved. It then tells each of the phones the new update that it should display. I didn't actually implement the rules of chess because it would be pretty tedious and not necessary for the demo we were doing. So you can technically move any piece anywhere on the board, but it would be very easy to implement the rules and just not let a move happen if it's invalid. And that's about it for chess. It's a pretty simple implementation, but it works. Let's talk briefly about the camera feature. Basically, when you type in the camera command, each phone will take a picture and send it to the server. The server will then save all of the images in a folder. When the app receives the camera command, it uses the AV foundation framework to take a picture. It then encodes it in base64, which is just a textual representation of the image. And then it sends that base64 encoded data over the WebSocket connection. 
The server will then receive the image, decode the base64, and write the result to a file. Super simple, but we get all of the pictures on the server easily. Next, let's talk about the Shrek walking meme. Basically, there is a clip from the movie Shrek where Shrek walks all the way across the screen. If you line up multiple devices and time the clip just right, it will look like Shrek walks from device to device. Obviously, this is well suited to our app. The Shrek video is built into the app, so the server just needs to tell each device when to start playing so that the timing is correct. There's about a second of footage before Shrek starts walking that we only want to play on the first device. So we tell the first phone to start from the very beginning and we have all the other phones fast forward about one second in. Once all the phones have the video queued up, the server will tell the first phone to start playing. It will then wait for 3.1 seconds, which is the amount of time that I determined to be correct. And then it will tell the second phone to play. The server will then wait for 1.5 seconds, because keep in mind there's about a second or so of footage that we only want to play on the first device. Then the third phone will play. The server will again wait for one and a half seconds, and then the fourth phone, and so on and so forth. The end result is that when the video ends on one device, it starts playing on the next device, and it gives the illusion that Shrek is indeed walking from screen to screen. And now we get to the final feature, by far the most complicated, but in my opinion, the coolest, the video screen. So how in the world do you get a ton of iPhones to all sync up, play different pieces of a video and make one giant screen? Well, it's actually not as hard as you may think. It just involves a little bit of math. My idea was to select a handful of videos to build into the app because streaming the video would have been way too complicated. Then each phone just needs to know which part of the video to display and it could create a video player, zoom in on that particular section, and play it. There's no need to pre-process the video and cut it up into chunks, or have the server determine which chunk of data to send to each phone, which would have been extremely complicated. We have the full video on each phone, and we can just zoom into the part that we care about. In order to determine which part of the video each phone should display, we have to do some math. First, we have to figure out the size of the so-called virtual canvas that our grid of phones makes up. To do this, I had to calculate the dimension of an iPhone 4 in pixels, which I was able to do given the resolution of the screen and the pixel density. Once we know the size of the virtual canvas that we'll be displaying the video on, we need to scale the video to fit. Because after all, we could have just one iPhone or we could have a hundred of them. To do this, I scaled the width of the video to match the width of the virtual canvas, and I scaled the height appropriately to keep the aspect ratio. I then do some math to vertically center the video within the virtual canvas, because sometimes the video will be taller or shorter. Now we're ready to determine which part of the video we should show on each phone. We know the row and column of each phone, so we can determine the coordinate of the upper left corner of that phone but keep in mind that the iPhone has bezels on all four sides and we can only display on the screen. To do this, I calculated the dimensions of the bezels in pixels, so we can just move our coordinate from the top left of the phone to the top left of the screen using these calculations. And that's it. We now know the size of the virtual canvas and we know the coordinate of the top left corner of the screen. The server will then send this data to the app along with the name of the video file that it should play. The app will then create a video player, load up the video, scale the video player to be the full size of the virtual canvas, and then align the video player so that the coordinate of the upper left-hand corner of the screen will actually be in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Once the app is done with this, it will tell the server that it's ready to play the video and the server will wait until every phone sends this ready signal. This is so that if one phone gets the message slightly late, it will have enough time to get fully set up before the video starts and thus it won't be out of sync. Finally, the server tells all of the phones to start playing. And since the WebSocket communication is pretty much instantaneous, all of the phones start playing basically at the same time. It's definitely not perfect. Some of the phones are a little bit out of sync and some runs are better than others. And with that, I present to you the world's first absolute iMac. The iMac Mini. Yes, the iMac Mini is the world's first absolute iMac. The 
but it honestly works surprisingly well. I did try some other things to get the phones to sync up better, but I really couldn't get anything else to work. And besides, we were only able to get up to 71 phones before our router got overloaded and new phones weren't able to join the network. All in all, I think it turned out pretty well. So that's about it for Multiphone. We have the server, the app, five pretty cool features, and a nice framework that I could easily build on in the future if I were so inclined. The app and the server are both open source on GitHub. You can find links in the description below and check them out if you're interested. I wouldn't recommend running the app yourself because it was explicitly written to run on old versions of iOS and I have no idea if it will work on modern devices. But if you're just curious to know how the code works, you can check it out. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you wanna see more 101 iPhones content, you can check out the video on Luke's channel where we unboxed the phones and played around with them. If you have ideas for features I could add, feel free to comment them down below. If this video does well and there's enough interest, I could do a part two where I add some more features and maybe even try it out on some different devices. Maybe some devices with bigger screens. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you wanna see more content, whenever that may be. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.